So thank you so much for joining with us um, and congratulations. Uh, the first set of bids uh, have been received in terms of the primary interest in IDBI banks take sale. So give us a sense of uh, what has been the response. Uh, you know, we know at times it's difficult for the government to actually divulge, divulge details, but uh, you know, give us a sense, like when you say multiple, what does that really mean? Well, I think the transaction advisor, uh, he has advised that there's been good response. So uh, we don't, re as per our process, we don't reveal the names and the number for uh, maintaining integrity of our bidding process. So I would not be uh, in a position to tell you the number on the names, but uh, suffice it to say there's a good response. Good response, multiple bids. So, uh, you know, at least at our end, we can safely assume that at least three and more bids uh, have come in. And uh, again, in terms of the potential sectors which are represented, uh, mainly banks, non-banks, or is it a healthy mix? Well, it's a healthy mix, both domestic and foreign. Excellent, sir. Excellent. So what is the next uh, in terms of uh, the process now going forward? Uh, would you be inviting the financial bids uh, pretty soon or it will have its own timeline? Now, after, uh, after the initial bids come in, there is a question of... Uh, you know, checking the bids and the papers, which the transaction advisor does. Also, there is a uh, fit and proper in this case involved right in the beginning with the RBI. You've done that at the U.S. stage as well? Yeah, this is a stage at which it will be done by the RBI. Now that the bids have come the, in? Once the bids are coming in. And accordingly, I think they will be uh, submitting papers to... Uh, the qualified ones mm -hmm. will be submitting papers to the RBI. Mm -hmm. We have a, a virtual uh, data room, then it will be opened under the non-disclosure undertaking, where there will be sufficient uh, non-material uh, which is not in public domain. Uh, in respect of that, uh, there will be greater amount of information that will be uh, made available to the bidders. Mm. And uh, also, s subsequently, the draft share purchase agreement and other d definitive documents, the drafts of that will be shared for their response. So this is what is called a due diligence process. Once this is completed, then the RFP is issued for the inv invite of the financial. Correct. Bank. So uh, how long do you expect this due diligence to last? How many months? And when do you actually plan to call the financial bids? Will it be after the due diligence process or uh, maybe by March? Well, the timing actually does depend on transaction to transaction. It depends upon the complexity of the transaction, the nature of this, whether the site visits are to be planned, whether, uh, you know, uh, what kind of assets uh, a transaction in that particular company has. So it depends. And this is a bank. I think it's more like uh, in the nature of uh, financial information and accounting information, not in terms of as much on the physical aspects. But nevertheless, I think... Uh, Three to four months is a minimum time which is required for due diligence process. Okay. So you will be inviting the financial bids only post that? That's right. Okay. And uh, you will be well into the new financial year uh, by then. So uh, a tentative timeline uh, would be sometime closing the transaction, maybe by next Jan, sir? Or even before that? I think that will be much earlier than that. But it will be in FI24. But it will be, I think, much earlier than that. Okay. So maybe before the uh, current calendar year Let closes. us hope. Let us hope. And we'll, we'll keep you informed how it goes. Right, right. So you mentioned foreign domestic both. So uh, do you think, in hindsight, the fact that, you know, you, uh, you know, gave three very clear categories, banks, NBFCs, PE firms, uh, you know, all of them can come in and a lot of uh, work was done between you and RBI and the other regulators. So you think that is now kind of paying dividends and will pay dividends in the months to come? I think that right from beginning, our uh, effort has been, since this is the first uh, uh, you know, transaction of its kind, to give sufficient clarity and also make it as larger, as open a process to have uh, competitive bidding. See, key to our process, okay. I've been always uh, stressing, okay. is the uh, you know, availability of competitive bids, mm -hmm. the size of the transaction, where most people will be fine comfortable. So we don't design our process for... Uh, mm -hmm you know, one or two players, but for a larger n a number of players, so there's a greater amount of bidding, and then there is obviously 
we would like the maximum amount of you know maximization. value maximization of our value of shares this is uh, these shares uh, in the government for example belong to the government of india and of course lic shares or lic has its own uh, shareholders and policy holders and so on so it's very important for us that we do the process in a competitive manner and we discover the best value so that's what is now going to unfold i mean uh, the process is going to be the bidding is going to be competitive uh, we can expect that yes please okay uh, sir in the past sometimes uh, you know and uh, you know, check me if i'm wrong uh, you know there were certain discussions way back you know 5 6 years back uh, and uh, there was some indication that maybe around you know 80 to 85 would have been a good bid um, and uh, we really don't know what happened post that so what what i'm just trying to ask probably is that whatever was there in the past will that also be a factor for the government to decide uh, you know the pricing of the bids as and how the process unfolds or you think that this is a fresh clean slate and uh, you know whatever you know whatever comes forward and whatever the reserve price the government decides at a later point in time that is how it's going to be the past is not going to cast a shadow so this is a price discovery process so we are out in the market to discover the price rather than the other way around mm. we don't determine the price and do it the benchmarking price or the reserve price is only an internal process for us to satisfy ourselves that you know we are not really you know uh, in a, in in a way selling it you know very below par but what exactly is the price is for the market to discover and a competitive pro- bidding process ensures that besides uh, any company you know what it is what is its value keeps on changing as you know in a dynamic economy very fast it depends upon you know it it not necessarily only depends upon the past but it it's a lot to do with future its present context and its future setting so it's a very complex process as you know and that's the reason why people you know different bidders would value it differently even though you know technically speaking we have the same quantitative processes in investment banking but the fact that you know the people attach different value to different price because essentially the valuation or uh, discover uh, price at the end of the day is also a subjective thing based okay. on assumptions about the future okay uh, so one or two uh, concerns over here you know uh, you know some uh, some experts or others in some quarters there is this uh, impression that uh, you know the legacy npas of idbi bank uh, could still be a concern uh, you know gre- uh, uh, you know aging of npas of course the provisioning norms come down but that could still be an overhang uh, what is the government's take on this could this be a stumbling block in the times to come maybe not looking at the way the you have got a, a good response quote and quote on the preliminary bid so far i don't think so because i think a lot of work has already been done on the health of the idbi bank over a period of time not only in terms of capitalization which was done but also the you know the net npa is what counts and that has been very very uh, so you don't think that over hang is going to be there okay uh, so also uh, you know you have been now post divestment your share in idbi will be counted as public shareholding sebi has given clarity on that front uh, there are certain terms and conditions attached to that so would the gi be meeting all of those you will not have a seat on the board you will not have uh, you know uh, 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 voting rights have so have so far been defined by sebi so are you going to meet all those three four terms and conditions if you have read it correctly that was initially the proposal that was basically our proposal because uh, it is the the government when it's mindful that if it is uh, wanting it to be you know sort of designated as public that doesn't mean you know you can't be a promoter in the public at the same time so it's clearly we are uh, getting off the promotership and that was our proposal which the sebi has agreed okay uh, so what about lic we given to uh, understand that lic probably also has made a pitch uh, in terms of treating their shareholding as public uh, we don't really know what has been the response so far so is it on board is it not on board has sebi rejected or accepted uh, and either ways how does that really look i think that's not really a very important issue uh, Why? because lic if uh, maybe lic in future would be public when it brings down the shareholding to a certain level which sebi wants it to 
So it's for the government that we wanted to be very clear about, because uh, uh, there I think uh, uh, you know whether to be director, whether to have director or not to have a director. Now, LIC is is at the end of the day is there in different companies. Of course, when it is there in different companies as an investor, it has to bring it down to a certain level. And uh, if it is exceeding a level, maybe at that level it might not be uh, granted a public status. But in future, yes, when they when they bring the because both LIC and uh, government are, do not intend to stay on there. It's only an interim arrangements that we are there for, as a financial investor, uh, both in terms of uh, the size of the transaction that it would mean, also because of the upside that we might like to take it in post disinvestment. Okay. So in both cases, I think both LIC and uh, government, they would like eventually to exit. Uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a time frame which will be defined in future. Okay, uh, but basically as of now, uh, has the regulator given clarity on LIC's uh, pitch, sir? Anything you can share with us? No, that's not the concern. I think we, in okay. the government was wanting to do it, push its own okay. thing and therefore their proposal has been agreed. Okay, okay. So LIC's pitch probably was not a material concern. What was material was the government's pitch. Got that. Uh, also, sir, uh, you know, you have also amended the SERA rules in terms of the minimum public shareholding norms. Uh, you know, SEBI is not, uh, SEBI is not so far says uh, uh, IDI bank post divestment will have to meet uh, the MPS norms within one year. But at the same time, government has amended the rules uh, on the other hand. So how do you see both of them panning out and will you be giving a clarity on, uh, you know, extension of exemption from MPS, uh, any kind of, kind of a deadline that you're looking at? So, so far the timeline has not been expressed and will that overrule uh, what SEBI has brought out, that one year timeline to meet MPS for IDBI bank? See, the SCR rule is a generic uh, thing. It doesn't really, uh, you know, it's not really for only for the IDBI bank. It's in general for the government, uh, uh, you know, a certain category where the government has substantial holding or the public sector companies have the substantial holdings. There, uh, you know, it is basically sometimes me meeting for other banks and meeting the public PSBs and CPSCs which are not yes i mean it sometimes it becomes difficult for uh, them to achieve mps in a time frame in which is required uh, also because you know uh, uh, as a government undertakings and all that some may not be doing well and if in order to do that they may not be takers for example for some in some cases, for example, bank, a reverse thing has happened where government had to recapitalize. So even something like uh, IDBI bank, which was an MPS earlier, mm. we, it had to slip into a non-MPS category. So there are different things which emerge, and I think in order to meet that eventuality, and that is not really a general blanket thing. It's only a power to exempt case by case, and also to for a, for a particular period. Right. So what is that so, going to be? So only the notification has, the, the new rules have made it clear that, number one, I mean, it's, it's clarified the language, which was already there since 2021. Secondly, I think an explanation has also been added that, uh, you know, it, it will not really disrupt this strategic disinvestment process in certain cases. For example, if you have given this one fine morning, you know, mm -hmm. if it gets out and doesn't fit into that public sector uh, definition, then it can't can't lose the thing, and it has to have a transition period, which was granted, which was granted earlier, earlier. in the first place. So, because that is granted to a to a company, mm. to an entity, and it is not to you know whether the ownership now, now based on you know ownership change, all of a sudden overnight, if you do that, that will be uh, unfair. Okay. And I what? think that is the eventuality which has been onboarded. And SCRR rules, in fact, takes away the generic rules, and within that, a specific notification that needs to be issued. So, what is the kind of deadline that you're thinking of in terms of extension of the uh, MP, of meeting the MPS norms? No, I mean that will be it will be there as a, as on date. In fact, IDBI Bank enjoys that uh, exemption till 2024. So, I mean, uh, it will be really clarified in due course as to which is a period in which MPS must be met.